Hi everyone, my name is Leanne and today I'm going to be reviewing the books that I read in June. So I'm still in a bit of a weird reading space. If you've been keeping up with my reading this year, which you know, the updates have been few and far between, so I don't blame you if you don't feel like you're in the loop. I don't even feel like I'm in the loop with my own reading, to be honest. But my reading has been a bit out of sorts this year. As we've progressed into the middle of the year, I'm starting to up the quantity of stuff I'm reading, like I'm getting into more of a rhythm with reading, but I'm also doing a lot of like starting stuff and not finishing it. That's not to say I haven't read some books that have slapped, I absolutely have. And keep your eyes peeled for another video where I'm going to be telling you about my favourite books of the year so far. But first, let's talk about June and I'm going to start by talking about two non-fiction books that were really interesting to kind of read um, relatively close to one another. So I read Notes to Self by Emily Pine. Emily Pine is a Irish writer. This is a collection of six essays from her that look at various different aspects of her life, including her alcoholic father and what it was like to care for him. She talks about the separation of her parents. Uh, she talks talks about unsafe situations that she's been in throughout her life um, and also there's a significant amount of discussion in this book around infertility. Many aspects of this book are very harrowing so do be aware of that going into it. The essays are superbly written and I think that's kind of why it is so harrowing. It's a remarkably honest collection of essays, it's definitely a tearjerker. One of the things I really appreciated in how Emily let us into her life was that she definitely doesn't kind of sugarcoat her own role in her life. She doesn't kind of present herself as an idyllic version of herself. She is self-critical while also, you know, giving herself sympathy for the very horrible situations that she's been in and the very horrible things that have happened to her. I also thought how she handled the discussions around infertility were done really well. I think often when we hear from people who have really wanted a child, it can unfortunately seem like they are invalidating the experiences of people who don't want children and at no point does Emily do this. And when an Irish writer handles topics of motherhood and or pregnancy, this is undoubtedly coloured by the barbaric experiences that so many pregnant people in Ireland have endured due to quite frankly barbaric laws around abortion and a lack of abortion rights. I think at the time this book was published it was published around the height of the repeal the eighth movement in Ireland which was essentially a movement that was leading up to a referendum to change the Irish constitution so it would allow for access to abortion in the Republic of Ireland. Uh, there has been progress made and that amendment has been reformed but there is also such a long way to go when it comes to abortion rights in Ireland. People in Northern Ireland still don't have access to abortion and of course uh, there are other parts of the globe where people don't have abortion rights or their abortion rights are being restricted and I was reading this at a time where uh, discussions around Roe versus Wade were very prominent, at least on my own social media or in my own echo chamber. Would definitely recommend this. There is a lot of uh, female rage, psychological exploration, and very touching emotion. And not long after I read Notes to Self, I read I Feel Bad About My Neck by Nora Ephron. This is another collection of essays that has a real central focus on womanhood and experiences of womanhood, but it is very different to Notes for Self. It is in many ways far more frivolous. <laughs> it has this kind of vibe to it that it's like older woman bestowing wisdom on a younger generation and that was kind of the impression I had of this book going into it and I think I was kind of just expecting something that was potentially a bit more profound and maybe that's an expectation that I put on the book that it didn't in any way promise me but just when I've heard people talk about this book they make it sound like reading it was a really formative experience. There are moments that are really entertaining and funny. There are moments that are steeped with privilege that you kind of just have to take with a pinch of salt. I think perhaps the best way for me to experience Nora Ephron's storytelling, because I can tell from these pages that she is a fantastic storyteller, I think the better way for me to experience that is through her movies rather than um, any anything in print. Form. Though I am intrigued by Heartburn, so if you've read that, let me know down in the comments and let me know if you think I should give that one a go. I also read a short story collection in June that was Rainbow Rainbow by Lydia Conklin. Each of the stories in this collection have an element of queerness to them and in fact a rainbow makes a kind of cameo appearance in all of them. 
But there's a real breadth of different experiences covered in these stories. There is a non-binary person who is preparing for top surgery during the COVID-19 pandemic. There is the story of a lesbian couple who enlist a friend as a sperm donor. Um, that was the first story in the collection and I actually think it was the strongest story, the one that I kind of got the most out of, the one that kind of made me stop and think the most. There was a story about a trans YouTube convention. There's an element of darkness to many of these stories but also I think characters even at their worst you can see them for their nuances and complexities. The characters feel like authentic real people. Naturally with this being a short story collection there are some stories that stuck with me, some that didn't, some that I enjoyed more than others as I said. Really the first story I thought was the most impactful of the collection um, but I would be intrigued to read more from this writer and I really appreciated the kind of breadth of experiences they included in this collection. I also read That Reminds Me which is a very very short book by Derek Owusu. So this book is about a young man named Kay. He is British Ghanaian and he is telling the story of his life uh, from his childhood up to the present day. When he was a baby he was taken into foster care and we later follow him being reunited uh, with his family. And the kind of framing of him telling us this is him actually telling Nancy who is the African god of storytelling. We're following Kay gradually kind of integrating into his family, integrating into the city, exploring his identity more. Also looking at things like religion, like sexuality, violence and addiction. I can tell that this was a really powerful book and I think if you are someone that feels a lot of personal resonance with it you would definitely find it a really powerful book. I didn't have that kind of connection to it which is no fault of the book. Not all books are you know written for me, that's fine. Um, but I also think the kind of fragmented way in which it was told uh, is something that I really struggle with as a reader. If it's kind of like jumping around a lot, if we're kind of getting things in bits and pieces, if it's told as if it's shards of glass, I personally struggle to kind of piece that together. The book has a kind of dreamlike quality which is something that I do struggle with as a reader. So I think my thoughts and feelings on this book don't do it in any way justice. It's a book that I have heard so many good things about. It won the Desmond Elliott Prize. So if this kind of fragmented style of storytelling is something that you actually find appealing, I would really urge you to pick that up because it definitely has that. I also read Ethan Frome by Edith Wharton. She read a classic. Who is she? Did she pick one of the shortest classics on her shelf? Yes, she did, but she still read it. So this is the second Edith Wharton book that I've read. And you know what? Decent. I think I quite like her. I had a solid time reading this. This book actually uses one of my kind of favourite storytelling devices, which is like when the novel is told by just some random guy that was there that has like nothing to do with the story, but he's just like, he was just there and he's telling you what happened. And he's telling you what happened between this guy Ethan and his wife and his wife's niece? Cousin. Cousin, not niece. So basically, Ethan has married Xena and they have what I would call a bearable existence. It's not necessarily fun, it's not exciting, but it's bearable. They're cracking on with life. Then enter Xena's cousin and Ethan is like, hello. And you know what? It's like Ethan has had Wes Nelson from Love Island whispering in his ear. He's like, yeah, I'm happy, but could I be happier with this sexy cousin who's just entered the picture? Basically, he's just like obsessed with her and things unfold from there. There's loads of like foreshadowing for the kind of tragic end to the story. You know there's going to be a tragic end from the very beginning. And you know what? I, I, I don't have many thoughts, to be honest. I read it, it was entertaining, we move on. Th those, those are really all of the thoughts that I have. I read a poetry collection, I read Anecdotal Evidence by Wendy Cope. Wendy Cope is one of my favourite poets of all time, but I have to be honest, don't think this one kind of tickled my pickle in the same way that other collections from her have. I don't think it's as funny as her other collections have been, or at least the ones I've read previously. It didn't have as much of an emphasis on sound effect and rhyme as her previous collections have. And that's not to say those elements weren't there at all. Like they definitely were. There were definitely like some humorous poems, some poems that had a real emphasis on sound and rhyme, but just like not as much as I kind of associate with Wendy Cope. It wasn't that I didn't enjoy this book, like I definitely did. I think I just had like super high expectations for it and I haven't been reading a lot of poetry recently. So I was kind of anticipating this being the collection that kind of pulled me out of that poetry rut and kind of reminded me how much I absolutely adore poetry. 
and that's not what happened so it felt like a disappointment even though it was actually a really great collection of poetry. In June I read one book for teens and that was Big Bones by Laura Dockrell. I have read a few Laura Dockrell books in the past um, but this is probably the one that I've seen the most kind of positive reviews for. So this is about Bluebell aka BB aka Big Bones and it's a book that is kind of full of body positivity. There are lots of people in BB's life who are kind of putting pressure on her to lose weight, um, particularly her mother and the relationship she has with her mother is very complicated as so often our relationships with our mothers are. But Bluebell doesn't see any reason why she should have to lose weight. She is very happy, she loves food. And actually the food writing in this was so good. Like Bluebell is such a good cook and the way the author like describes well what she is making is just it will make you hungry just like the pleasure and joy that she takes in food is such a beautiful thing not only is that a huge focus in this book but there's also a huge focus on sisterhood and that is a very complicated relationship the relationship that bluebell has with her younger sister the very like protective nature that she has over her and i loved that our protagonist while she was someone that we definitely have uh, a huge degree of sympathy towards and a huge amount of support for. She's definitely not uh, idealized. She is a flawed character and we see her come to like understand her flaws more. She is a teenager, you know, she's learning how to navigate the world and these sorts of relationships. Uh, there's also a romance element to this book, but it's very much a subplot. And I think there was kind of just the right amount of romance so that the focus was on Bluebell's relationship with herself, with her body, with her family, but just like a, a little bit of this guy, Max, and much of their kind of romance happens at the place that they both work, which is like a cafe. I love when there's like a cafe or bakery setting in a book. I think it's just very wholesome. Um, I also loved how this book drew attention to the different approaches people feel about formal education and how there's not just one kind of linear path that you need to follow in order to like be educated or get a career. I have a real fondness for this book. Um, I would really recommend it. We're gonna kind of gradually get younger. So if kids books aren't really your thing, it was nice to see it. But if you do enjoy me talking about kids books, you know I love to talk about kids books quite often. It's what I do for my job. Then do stick around because this one was great. This is Show Us Who You Are by Elle McNichol. So this is my second read from Elle McNichol. I read A Kind of Spark last year and I really loved it. This is her second book. I've got her third on the shelf waiting for me to read. I'm going to describe this as like Black Mirror for kids. So this book is about Cora and her involvement in pomegranate, which is this institution who have developed technology whereby you can speak to people in hologram form. So the individual is kind of interviewed by pomegranate and then pomegranate use like AI technology to build a version of this person that is meant to be like really authentic. And this service could be used in many different ways. You could use it to spend time with your favorite celebrity but you could also use it to spend time with a loved one who has passed away. And in that kind of very Black Mirror way, this institute is presenting itself as a very helpful, positive thing. You know, we are allowing people to maintain a relationship with a dead parent, for example. But there's actually a lot more sinister goings on beneath the surface. And Cora realizes that there is something very immoral going on, particularly with relation to neurodivergent people like she is. And I think it's so impressive how Elle McNichol presents this very kind of complex moral philosophical discussion in a way that is very digestible and understandable for younger readers. And while it seems like this is a discussion that is about something that's very far off in the future, the conversations that are kind of generated from this book are extremely relevant to how so many people think about autism or ADHD or any kind of neurodiversity in our contemporary society. So many people view these things as a disadvantage as something that you would want to do without, something you would want to cure. When the idea that something like autism should be cured is actually hugely offensive. I think Elle McNichol is quickly becoming just an auto buy, auto read author for me. She's absolutely fantastic. I've got her next book, Like a Charm, sat on my shelf. Um, so as I said, really keen to read that one soon as well. I read The Breakfast Club Adventures by Marcus Rashford, which he wrote alongside Alec Velassi Koya. Um, and it's illustrated by Marta Kissy as well. So this is about 12 year old Marcus, who uh, is a school footballer, but feels like he's kind of, you know, lost his confidence 
experience with it, lost his form with it. Reading that as a Manchester United fan who follows actual Marcus Rashford's career quite closely, felt quite close to home, to be honest. But basically, Marcus, the 12-year-old character, he loses his favourite football over the fence and that's kind of been the trigger for him kind of losing his confidence. He doesn't feel like he's ever going to get this football back until he meets the Breakfast Club investigators who are a group of friends, uh, people who Marcus wouldn't normally hang out with, who have kind of formed this like Scooby-Doo-esque gang who are like solving school mysteries. And as Marcus becomes more involved with the investigators, they realise that there may be something a bit more scary and a bit more spooky going on then a lost football. But along the way, Marcus is learning a lot about friendship, unlikely friendships, about not judging people. He's also learning about building his own confidence and that confidence coming from within. It was a really fun time. You know, it's probably not something that I'm gonna return to, but I would definitely recommend it for younger readers. Very readable, I had a fun time. And finally, I read Frankie's World by Aoife Dooley. Aoife is an Irish author illustrator. She is also autistic and so is our main character, Frankie. This is a graphic novel for younger readers, which tells us all about Frankie's experiences in school and not quite fitting in, and how, because she is autistic, she views the world slightly different to most people around her. Frankie doesn't know who her dad is, and she believes that if she finds her dad, she will also find answers as to why she doesn't quite fit in. And I thought her journey towards finding her dad was done really well, where as an adult reader, I could tell the complexities that must exist in that relationship, in the history between her mother and her father. I could tell that they were there as an adult reader, but it was told in a very digestible way for a child reader, and also in a way that was free from judgment or prejudice. And along that journey that does deal with quite serious topics, there is so much humour. This is a really funny graphic novel that I think has so much humour that will entertain adult readers and child readers alike, both in the actual writing but also in the illustrations. Also a huge amount of diversity included in those illustrations as well. Really funny, really cleverly told would recommend. So there we have it, that is everything I read in June. I thought I'd had a bit of a mixed reading month, but like now that I've sat down and spoke to you about it all, it was a really cracking month actually. All of the books that I've mentioned will be linked down below in the description if you want to find out more about them. If you've read any of these books and want to share your thoughts on them, do leave me a comment down below or let me know what you're currently reading. If you don't have anything in particular to say and you want to let me know that you're here, leave me your favourite food emoji in honour of Big Bones. I hope you guys are doing well and I will speak to you in my next video.